We give our thoughts on Watchmakers Day, AP open their heart to us and everybody else, Popeye makes an appearance, plus we spy in the watches on the red carpet at the Oscars. All this and more on today's show. Welcome to the Scottish Watches podcast. We're back in Scotland. We have been on our travels, but you should be travelling to the show notes. If you want to see what we're talking about, all the pictures, the spec, then there'll be a link in the video description of this episode. But yes, we are back from Watchmakers Day. It was a hell of an experience. We're going to get down and dirty. We're going to explain a little bit about what we thought of it, because you've heard in the previous show from all the guests who were attending, who were showcasing, promoting and displaying their stock, plus the new watches that they brought along specifically for the event itself. But it's now time for Dave and myself to unload, to unleash, to empty our sacks of knowledge on you guys. So how's Dave? Have you recovered from your travels? Dave has uh, recovered. He was somewhat tired, it has to be said, for the last few days as he's been here, there and everywhere. But yes, it was well worth the extremely early start from Switzerland to get to London for that show because it panned out very well. The show was In no other words, excellent. That's the only way I can describe it. But we will give you a little more detail as to why it was excellent and why I'm sure when it happens next time, it will be even more excellent. Well, we're going to tell you about that right now, but we're going to tell you first of all, if you're watching this on YouTube, the chances are you're missing half the story because as I alluded to, we do two shows a week. One always appears on YouTube, one usually appears on Spotify, sometimes it appears on YouTube afterwards, it's just to edit two videos a week is a tricky thing to do, so always check Spotify, always check our website for all the details. And hopefully we do have that video from Watchmakers Day out quickly, because I am turning the volume up to 11, the amplification is on, and we're going to just go through things on our own here just now. We were both down there. It was a tremendous event. We have been to numerous shows across the world, not just within the watch sphere, but motoring, all kinds of stuff. And this one really stuck out. And I think we're going to get down to why it stuck out shortly. For me, I think it was potentially because it was the first of its type and all these brands that some of which we'd never heard of all congregated in the one place and they'd never experienced going to a show. They hadn't travelled to the States. They hadn't done Wind Up. They hadn't done Watches and Wonders. They hadn't done Geneva Watch Days. And because they were new, their products were new and they were super excited and keen to speak to a receptive audience, it just kind of worked. So Dave, I've got a massive amount of stuff to get through on how we got to the show, what happened there. But you you can give us your thoughts on it first. Excellent. No other two ways about it. I have been to many a show, as you mentioned, Ricky, whether it be watches or other things. And out of all the shows I've been to, this one just kind of felt right. And from the moment you stepped through the door, security were friendly. Everyone at the door was friendly. None of this kind of, I'm not sure if you can come in. Real nice, happy, easy going. We got in And the minute you kind of walked in the room, you just get a nice vibe and feel about the place. It was busy. It was buzzing. It was a bit of noise happening around as folk were talking, but it just felt kind of together. Didn't feel that there was any brands knocking heads. Didn't feel that there was any tension in the room. Just all together, a really nice vibe. And for me, that kind of set the tone for the whole event. When you walk in and you feel that you're happy and you're comfortable, it just kind of settles everything down. So that's my just super high level overview of it. Really nice venue. Difficult sometimes to get a venue that works. Sometimes they're a bit noisy and echoey. Sometimes they're a bit boring. This was a building that's, I believe, owned by the Royal Horticulture. I can say it right. The Royal Hor- Is it Horticultural? Horticultural. Horticultural. It should be the Royal Horological Society. It could be the Royal Horological, but it's a Horticultural. We can change it for next year. We can just bring our own signage and put it out the front. We could. I think they might be a bit upset about that because it is a very nice building. Big glass roof, which I wouldn't say it became a problem later, but as it was unseasonably mild and quite a nice day with the sun out in London, that big glass roof did mean that with a lot of people in the building, the temperature began to rise a little, shall we say. You're such a money bastard, because the fact that it had a glass roof meant you could actually see the watches. It wasn't artificial light. Well, if one hadn't butted in, one would have said, but aside from the heat, the light was excellent. It was a really wide, even kind of light in the room, which meant that taking photographs wasn't the usual affair at a watch show of put your bag down, find your lights, get your light panels out, hope the battery's charged, and then try and move it around to get a good photograph. Nope, you could get some pretty solid photographs just with a half reasonable camera and the good light that we had on the day. Lots of brands there. Everything from 
a couple of hundred pounds their retail price points right up into the stratosphere with the likes of Roger Smith with a watch that nominally had a price tag of around half a million pounds but again no feeling of kind of strangeness going on in that environment so yeah really really enjoyed it um was that your initial thoughts as well when you got there well I'll run through my busy week because it was a hell of a week last week Started off, unfortunately, with some funeral planning arrangements that will end at the tail end of this week as we're recording. But then it was Mona's birthday, so we had all the celebrations there. And because she's got family down south in London, she had the great brainwave of, let's not fly, let's not train, let's drive. And that was a great idea and also a terrible idea at the same time because on the way back, I fell asleep numerous times in the car, which with her driving is quite a feat. But yeah, we got down there, we drove all night or she drove all night. I did a little bit of it. Set off at 8pm from Scotland. Took until around about 4am to actually get to the hotel. And on the way down, my phone was pinging. WhatsApp was going crazy. There was messages and emails coming in from all kinds of people from all across the world. Tim, who we met over in Dubai, that's working with Andrew Morgan, he was messaging to say, that's us boarded a plane, we're on our way to the UK, and as I mentioned, we finally got there, around about quarter past four, and that's when we found out that there are no car parks in London at hotels, something we were not aware of, but at four in the morning, we were pretty disappointed that we had to abandon the car, hope for the best, go in and get a sleep. So skipping most of Thursday, because I went on a bit of a watch pilgrimage through London, because I've not done that before, never done Burlington Arcade, never been to the new Grand Seiko place or the Breitling boutiques. I did so, but we'll talk about that in a future show because it doesn't really have anything to do with Watchmakers Day. I ended up getting picked up at the Hard Rock Cafe after a couple of cocktails by Simona to go and meet and greet her family. That was a great end to the Thursday, and then the Friday was set up day. And that was the one where we'd been pegged to come in while all the things were getting, the booths were getting made, the signage was getting put up, the red carpets were getting placed. We got to steal people for the show that you heard in the previous edition. It would not have been feasible to actually do it on show day. I didn't think it would, and it turned out to be the case. And a couple of the brands that we kind of postponed because there was not enough space or they were too busy at the time, we never got a chance to speak to. We never got Roger, we never got Jose from Isotope, and we never got Piers from Pinion. So we're going to have to make amends with those guys in the future. But setup day was great. Nothing was a problem. The signs went up, everything went according to plan, and we got, I think it was 10 or 11 interviews that you've already heard. And if you've not heard, go through the back catalogue and have a listen because it is well worth it. The only problem is the watches they spoke about. Some of them were only available at Watchmakers Day. Another reason that you should have come along, you should have listened, you should have got your tickets. It was, as you say, a fantastic location. Met loads of friends. It was really busy, it was really loud, but we managed to relax a little bit, get those recordings in the bag and get them out to you guys. At night we managed to grab dinner with Roger Smith, his family, Katja, Alistair from the Alliance and Mark Wheeler was also along, so that was great on setup day, setup night. Then the big day itself, thankfully the hotel we ended up in was one street away from the venue, which meant we didn't have to Uber And we could cart all our equipment round and set up. We didn't even get a chance to use most of it. We were so busy. People kept walking up to Dave, myself, Simona, Mark Wheeler that was with us. And talked, talked, talked the entirety of the event. I think I managed to film maybe five minutes from start to finish. Because there was just so many people there wanting to speak to us. And it was amazing meeting you guys in real life. And putting faces to names. There were some people that I'm pretty sure Dave will agree with, that we were talking to for five minutes, waiting for that key piece of information to drop where we could go, I know your Instagram handle. I know who I'm talking to. And by the end of it, we'd managed to fudge our way through. I think that's pretty accurate. You know, it was actually lovely. Uh, A little bit kind of uh, on at ease sometimes when folk come up and start professing how much they enjoy the podcast. It's, I guess, not the reason I primarily do it. We do it because it's great fun. And we know you guys enjoy listening to it. But... You know, when the the fame and fortune sometimes comes to strike, well, not so much the fortune, more the fame, when people come up and say they really enjoy listening to us on the way to work or when they're out their run. It's very very nice to hear for sure. But yes, sometimes you're thinking going, hmm, name, maybe a name might help, maybe an Instagram handle so that we can maybe give you a call out on the show. But that's not always forthcoming either. But yes, the request for selfies, uh, why anyone would want a selfie with my ugly mug is... Unbeknownst, people do need new dartboards. 
so I hear. But yeah, we met so many people. GZM Picks is one that stands out in particular, and I only figured out who he was when we got home and he had posted some stuff. And he was walking around with us, looking at my camera, saying, Thanks for the shout outs and the show. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? I had no Scooby Doo who he was because I don't think he introduced himself at the beginning or he used his real name. Uh, but there was no trouble, there was no problems. I had concerns being in London that perhaps some nefarious characters might be around. Paul Thorpe did turn up, we'll talk about him later on. And the queues, wow. The queues outside leading up to the 10am open and it was a split system. You could come in the morning or you could have an afternoon ticket. It was just because in this day and age with health and safety, you can't throw a few thousand people into a room at the one time. You need to stagger it. But the queue was round the corner. Uh, various people got footage of that. Inside, the queue to buy pizza watches was incredible. I thought Roger Smith was a big attraction and he was. But having Rich there and later on Andrew McCutcheon of Time and Tide fame, they were there wearing pizza garb, pizza hats, they had the proper livery, it wasn't a cheap costume from Ann Summers, which is probably what they wear usually, and the queues of people queuing up to get these things was amazing, they were handed it in the pizza box, it was all signed, McCutcheon had his daughter with him, she was drawing things and signing things as well. The feeling in the room was just electric and in a good, massively positive way. Nobody sneaked in, nothing was stolen, nothing was broken, nobody was unhappy, even the folks that turned up early. They sometimes got in, sometimes they had to wait. There was not a problem the entire day and I decided I was with friends so I double-wristed it, my new favourite watches or my newest latest watches and I felt completely safe in the place and actually leaving which is really odd for being within the bounds of London. Now on the day itself, I think I'll let Dave talk for a little bit and then I'll bounce back in with my thoughts because... He had his ideas. He was doing a lot of stuff with Red Bar because they had a massive presence there. Kathleen was across from the States and Dave was talking to all the chapter heads and all the people. So take it away, Dave. So yes, when the doors opened, there was the mad rush to Studio Underdog. Obviously, a lot of demand for those pizza watches. That said, he had a lot of his regular range with him as well. All the other stands were busy as well, though. So let's say it wasn't just about Studio Underdog. During the entire day, all the stands were busy all the time. I really felt sorry for a lot of the guys where they didn't have many staff. Maybe it was just themselves, the family, the owner. They didn't get chance to have their lunch even because there were so many people there the whole day. And it didn't die off. Most shows I go to, people come in, gets busy for a bit, then suddenly it dies away. Just didn't see any of that from the very start to the very finish. So it was fantastic. Huge numbers of people, people talking to us, people talking to lots of other people there from YouTube and podcasts such as Adrian Barker, who was floating around taking pictures. Obviously, Andrew McCutcheon was there and there was the Watchbox Diaries. Lucy was there as well, amongst many others. I'm trying to think of them all off the top of my head, but likewise, there were so many that you just forget who they were until you suddenly see a picture of them beside you. So yes, just... Just a great environment. I, I super enjoyed it. You missed out Andrew Morgan. How could you miss out Andrew Morgan? The man with the talking hands who used to be with another brand but now does his own thing. A couple of things you did mention there. Andrew McCutcheon from Time and Tide. I have known him for maybe four years, I think it was. He first came on the show. And this was the first time talking to him where, I don't know if it was the gravity of the event, but he was so normalised. He didn't have the hype, the hyperbole of the showman and obviously from Australia and a bit of a Hugh Jackman character himself. I don't know, there was just a grounding to the whole event. I got to chat to him without that veneer and got down a little bit past all that and there was a lot of similarities. So yeah, really connected with him and various other people that come up to see us. Uh, you mentioned Studio Underdog and the amount of watches he sold and doing a quick calculation on the phone there times £550 equals nearly £4 million worth of sales, which is incredible and blows away a lot of this, the talk that's been going around about the British watch industry of recent times. Bumped into the guys from Accurist, Oliver was there, he'd been on the show before, spoke to the gentleman at Brooklands, spoke to the guys at Zero West, even the guys at Brooklands, they said that loads of folks were coming up saying that they'd never heard of them before the podcast. So again, thank you listeners for going and speaking to all these brands and hyping things up a little bit because that's what we're here for, we're here to introduce new brands, new watches. And another brand that have been on the show as well, Bowcroft. 
had a fantastic stand there and those guys were busy the entire time as well many of them kind of reaching out and saying that they'd heard about them via the podcast so we're doing a little to try and push the narrative of British watchmaking amongst many other brands as well so great to see those guys all in one room got to bounce into one of the cops and they're your friends so you can tell me which one it was it was the cop with the Scottish accent that had been on the show a number of times he's with the Met Flying Squad does all the stuff to do with watch robberies and yeah we should be bringing those guys back on sooner or later also bumped into Shami from Mologato a great guy doing watches from £90 all the way up and he sold out rather quickly because people go into these types of events they're always after a souvenir and if you've got 90 quid in your pocket, 550 pounds in your pocket, or a couple of grand, there was something for everybody at the show. You're absolutely right. Kevin from the Met Police was there without Tom in tow this time, but he was having a jolly good time. He was sent on a mission by his wife, who he, who has managed to get thoroughly into the watch collecting sphere through him as well, as she was in demand for a pizza watch, having had been bought a studio underdog for her Christmas. Something I didn't collect, but I saw, because the guy had been messaging me and whatsapping me, and I hadn't got back to him, because that is one of my follies. I am very, very busy sometimes, and everything just disappears. Even getting two shows a week out is sometimes a little bit tricky. But a guy called Ben Rousseau had something called the Tempest and this was a wall clock that he'd custom designed that displayed time in a kind of digital format using lights and you need to see what I'm talking about to understand it very futuristic, very Tron very fifth element but he was there in the corner with Roger Smith showcasing all this stuff so again great things as I say Paul Thorpe turned up uh, best dressed on show from what I can gather and he was doing I thought it was a live stream but it actually turned out it was a recording and he grabbed me and Dave and dragged us in Dave escaped but I talked for a couple of minutes about things and made the comment was it okay that I was there because I was Scottish and we were in England indeed and Dave indeed did escape as maybe that wasn't entirely his vibe but yes we didn't get thrown out we didn't get thrown out the show we didn't get thrown out the country so we must be doing something right we spoke to Paul from Ferrer he's got a very different take on things He's very analytical and he was kind of talking at length about the fact that, you know, he runs a proper business, but other people in the room, they didn't know what profit and loss really meant. And then there was some comments, that, you know, there's the good, there's the bad. We'd spoken about Bremont joining the Alliance when they told us they were going to do that a number of months ago. But they hadn't. There have been some changes. There are some rumours going around. There are some changes for the positive. And David Rato was there in top form, walking around, chatting with people, saying, listen, we will be here at the next one. We didn't want to announce anything at this because we didn't want to take anything away from the guys that are currently there. But we have some plans afoot. Check us out at Watches and Wonders. And yeah, 2024 25 will be a big year for them. But it was an amazing event. And then we had a great dinner. We had a bit of a preview at night afterwards. We went along, we met up with the folks from Christopher Ward, and they showed us their next latest and greatest. And we can't say anything because we are sworn to secrecy, but I think people will like this. And this might be, I said I wasn't going to buy any watches this year, this may be my next watch. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But it was great to speak to all our friends, everybody that turned up, the brands, new and old. I can't think of any negative points whatsoever at the show. And all I can say is I can't wait for next year. I don't know if they'll use the same location. I don't know if they're going to do it over two days. I don't know what their plans are. But no matter what it is, all the naysayers, all the people that waited, all the people that didn't, they will next year. So yes, let's see what next year brings. Hopefully bigger, better and even more lively. Indeed. And you'll want to stay tuned to Scottish Watch's podcast in audio and in video and on socials and on web because when we find out that information we will pass it on to you guys and jump at the chance to get your tickets early because so many people even up to the very day itself they were wanting to come they couldn't come they were begging the brand Mike France was saying that so many people had been in touch with him and his team at Christopher Ward saying hey I'm a good customer can I come along and there was nothing they could do everybody was clicked in and clicked out no escaping that so congratulations once again to Katia for almost single handedly putting this event on it was a one girl show Alistair was in the background you had Roger Mike Nick at Fears all the brands helping out but it was Katya that was dealing with everybody. And I know what it's like running events with a team of 20 folks, having one or two people, 
incredible. So there we go, well done. And we got some information through. We actually get quite a lot of gossip through. And one of the pieces of gossip that arrived was about the Snoopy. Allegedly, an email went out from Omega Seller Retailers Boutiques saying that there was a problem as in nobody was going to be getting Snoopies anymore. Dave, what is the bottom line here? It's not true. That's probably the most succinct way of putting it. They have come out and said, nope, it is not discontinued. We will still be making and delivering them. I think possibly it was a very badly worded email that maybe was to give guide to anyone who is to come along right now and suggest that they might want one. Maybe the waiting lists are rather long and maybe the chances of getting one any time in the near future are a little remote. And I think the email that went out maybe alluded to them stopping producing them. Turns out that's not the case, and that is from Omega HQ themselves. So no, it's not discontinued. Can you get one soon? Probably not. If you join a waitlist now, if you're even allowed to, will you get one? Probably not anytime soon. If you've been on for a while, might you? Hopefully yes. Okay, that kind of explains a lot. And uh, there was lots of rumours, lots of things floating around saying that waiting lists were now closed, they only produce X amount. But Dave has cleared that up. And even RJ from Fratello, Mr Speedy Tuesday himself, he posted on Instagram saying, lot of bollocks. But when we're talking about cartoon characters, there is another one that's floating around. Somebody from my childhood kind of went out of copyright a number of years ago, and that is Popeye. He's been used not quite as much as Mickey Mouse and various other characters, but he has made an appearance on the dial of a number of watches, including Gerald Genta watches, etc, etc. And he's turned up on a reservoir watch that is available out with the Siddiquis in the Far East. And even though it is not available for general sale across the world, this looks amazing. We love that brand. We love the guys in Dubai, and we have a lot of listeners and viewers across there. So Dave, tell us all about this little timepiece. This is the fourth time that Reservoir have done a collaboration using Popeye on their dials. And in this case, a limited edition of 100 pieces, exclusively available through Siddiqui and Son. Now, I like this. It's very fun. You know, we've seen Snoopy on the dials of watches. We've seen Mickey Mouse on the dial of watches. As Ricky said, a lot less so with this one, but this works super well. A, it is the sailor Popeye, but not in a boat. He's in the desert on a camel, looking a little bit like a pirate, even with a pirate's parrot in there as well. As you would expect from Reservoir, they like to use a jumping hour complication, and that's definitely in the cards, so you're not going to be disappointed with that. You've also got the retrograde minutes on there as well. Now, unlike some of the previous versions of this watch, this one uses a slightly newer movement. It's based around a Le Jeu Parade base, but it has their proprietary jumping hour and retrograde minutes module on there. It's just a great looking watch. Definitely check out the show notes to get a look at this because it kind of is difficult to explain aside from being it looks exactly like a cartoon except he's on a camel. Now that may come across as a little expected but I think in the case of this watch it just really works. Coming in at €4,900, just a great fun watch. If you like your cartoon characters on watches and you like something a little different, this one will potentially very much be for you. That is, if you can get your hands in one. But I'm sure if you reach out to someone at Siddiqui, they might be able to help you along the way to get your hands in one. That is if they've not already sold out. 100 pieces isn't a lot for this, and this is one of the best looking Popeyes, one of the best looking reservoir watches that I've seen in a long time. And it just what happens, we have some contacts out in Dubai. So if you do, you may be able to get two. And now would be a good time to tell you, there's another episode in our back catalogue. It was maybe six or seven months ago that we had all the guys from Reservoir chatting about, explaining about, talking about the history of the brand, the watches, how they don't just use one different complication in their timepieces, which could be the retrograde. They also have jump hours built in. They've got loads of cool technology in there. And these are watches that are tank tough. Usually when you mix and match, we mentioned Genta. They have a range of different watches at a very elevated price point. But when you mix and match all these complications, things can get tricky and things can break easily. But these things in Reservoir watches, the movements have been fettled so that you can play around with them. You can go forwards and backwards and things do not snap. They do not have to go back to get fixed. But something that could be doing with a bit of fixing could be Hodinkee. 
Because a couple of rumours, again this is the gossip episode, a couple of rumours have been floating around and Tim Mossel at the Watchbox is not somebody who minces his words. He doesn't come out with anything unless he has researched it, he knows what he's talking about and he can back things up. This has always been the case with him. And in the episode that went live last night, he actually used the first couple of minutes of the show to talk about the fact that Hodinkee might be in dire straits. There were some things on his Facebook group talking about the fact that their COO and their CTO had left the building and then I reached out to somebody that kind of was involved with Hodinkee, used to be involved with Hodinkee and they replied and said that most of the VIP team have also gone and there are talks that the company might be up for sale. So that was kind of an interesting thing to look at. I noticed on their website and different pages when you're reading articles down the side, they have now got their limited edition watches there to buy. Buy it now buttons, which they never used to do. And again, that Ed Sheeran is still for sale. It definitely seems like all is not well at Hidinki Towers. That business having undergone quite a few transformations over the last few years and possibly the slight, shall we say, downturn in the overall watch market is beginning to bite. So let's see where that one goes. We should probably do that thing we always forget to do and that is the wrist check. If you've been watching the video, you might have seen there is something on the wrist here that looks a little bit dark coloured. So let me just explain all. And Dave likes to come second, so he's going to this episode. So on the wrist today is a watch that's currently embargoed as we record. But by the time it appears online, and definitely by the time it appears on YouTube, the cat will definitely be out of the bag. So I can talk all about this little grey number. And it is a combination. It's not just from one company, but it's a combination of Nodus and Raven Watches. This is called the Trail Trekker, and it looks a little bit like, perhaps, a Bamford Explorer 2 from Rolex. Similar kind of bezel arrangement, similar kind of font, but hey, loads of people have used this in the past. The guys at Christopher Ward have done one. Even Grand Seiko have got a very distinctive, similar GMT bezel. This watch is unlike the other ones I have seen from Nodus. It is completely different looking. The fact that it's got the DLC treatment on the case, the clasp, the case back, even round to the crown itself. Not the bezel. That is a Cerakote ceramic coated bezel, which is even tougher and hard wearing than the DLC, I am led to believe. But this watch here, you'd expect it to be a lot of money because it's a true GMT watch, although it does use the flyer style arrangement, it's the Myota 9075 inside, beating at 28.8 thousand vibrations per hour, with a deviation of plus or minus 8 seconds a day, 42 hours of power reserve, and coming in, not limited, but coming in at a price of 875 US dollars. If you're looking at the pictures, if you're looking at the video, you'll see it looks like it's got a blue rehot. I don't think it has. I think they've just used generous applications of under sapphire anti-reflective coating. They don't have a colour match date disc, but I'm going to forgive them this time because it matches those indexes that are applied on the dial very nicely. And the GMT hand on this one comes in in a very kind of off yellow, almost orange coloration. If I pop it round, take it off the wrist, you'll see that the clasp is fantastic. As with most notices, you've got a quick release bracelet system with various different options for straps and it has got a quick adjust so you can divers extend this out depending if you're going for a dive or you're just getting a little bit clammy because summer is round the corner. It is a fantastic watch, really happy the guys have sent this over. Massive departure from the sector sport of the past and this will be a big seller, I am pretty sure, once it goes on sale. And by the time you hear this, it will be on sale. So check the show notes, there'll be links, there'll be details. And if you like the looks of this, you can go and grab one. And I forgot to say, it comes in at 395 millimeters, so not too big. Right, so that's my wrist check done. Fantastic new watch from the guys that know this, super happy about it. They're actually involved in putting on some shows, not just in the States, but across the world. And we're going to have to talk about them in the future. But it's time for Dave to reveal all. What have you got on the wrist today? Indeed, that is a fine looking watch with that kind of grey colouration on there. I really like it. I quite like a grey finished watch. I've always had a little bit of a hankering for the, the grey dark side of the moon ceramic from Omega. But yeah, that watch at $875 is going to be a little cracker if you want that kind of style and look and that size being very wearable by many wrist sizes. Yeah, I think you're right there. And I do like that little blue 
colour that keeps popping up and it's not a blue o-ring as I thought. It is possibly, as you mentioned, just the AR coating, the way it reflects in that watch. Looks fantastic. Dave has his Casio Tron on. Now this is a rather shiny little number. The bracelet in many ways actually reminds me a little bit of the bracelet on the Speedmaster Ed White, but it has to be said, maybe not quite as well made, but then you wouldn't expect so for around £450. But you can see the kind of little effect on the dial there. This is actually very well made. It has the full Bluetooth module in here as well. So although it looks quite basic on the face of it, and you've got the really nice little kind of glowing backlight, it does have all singing dancing features as you would expect to see on many of the higher end G-Shocks. Links to your smartphone app and it allows you to do lots of little adjustments and such like on there. Very wearable, nice size, don't know exactly what size it is but without the lugs it definitely wears in and around the size you would expect from most 38s but as you can probably see from this video it is a fingerprint magnet. Even if you clean it the second you touch it you get little fingerprints all over those nice shiny surfaces. But yes, interesting little piece but by all accounts pretty much sold out the moment they launched it globally. That said, there was a few doing the rounds in the UK but they sold out I believe in under five seconds on the website and there was a small number in the G-Shock store which is a bit strange considering it's not the Casio store but the G-Shock store had a small number as well which lasted no more than an hour by all accounts. So yes, very wearable, cool little watch. It is a Casio, it's a bit of a nod to past 1974 when their first watch came out. So nice little number. We talked about this on the show. We know that it sold out in America super quick and then we'd found out it sold out in the UK just as quick. So very happy that you managed to get one of these. But then again, Dave is connected. Dave knows people. Dave can get watches. Uh, I really like the look of that one. It is a bit of a fingerprint magnet. I did get to have a look at it down in London when Dave had it. It's not my aesthetic. I'm more a G-Shock person, but having said that, I have got the Casio Royale. I've got various other ones from the past. And my first introduction to watches was way, way back in the 80s when I was gifted a Casio watch. So yeah, it is a good throwback to the past. The price on it, it's worth it when you see the bracelet. It's worth it when you see the case design. And it doesn't matter the cost of a module because you can throw a Seiko NH35 in something that costs about 20 quid. So the module cost is not the whole sum of its parts. It is the bracelet, the clasp, the watch head, the design, the R&D. And when you put it all together, that is a funky little number. Now we should probably talk about something that is a little bit more funky, a little bit more expensive and probably equally as hard to come by. And that is a new watch from Audemars Piguet. It's silver looking, but it's not made of silver. It's not made of stainless. It's not made of anything apart from white gold and precious metals. And you don't really have a funky dial to look at because you can see straight through and into the movement. I'm a guy that likes a skeletonized watch. I like open work dials. I like all that kind of jazz. But Dave, tell us what AP have been up to. So this is the AP White Gold Royal Oak Extra Thin Open Work. So back in 2022, it was the 50th anniversary of the Royal Oak Collection. And at that point, AP introduced a number of special edition watches, including the steel cased variant the original, the OG, and they brought out an extremely limited edition version of this watch. They didn't last long, they're long gone. They also had a few rose gold and yellow gold variants and some platinum or white gold potentially then as well. But what have they done? They have now brought out that original extra thin version with an open worked movement in there as well. It's the nearest you're going to get to that look and feel of steel, albeit quite a lot more expensive but there are no more steels because they were so limited edition. This is, as far as skeletonized watches go, pretty much top of the pile. Huge amounts of work gone into this watch in terms of hand finishing. Everything movement wise has been done by hand. No industrial manufacturer finishing leveling here. All of this will have taken a considerable amount of time which of course will show in its price tag 
which is a huge 124,100 US dollars. So definitely not chump change, it has to be said. Around 324 polished V angles in this skeleton work going on there as well. And as you can imagine, a lot of training and a lot of time to get to that level of work. I think as far as skeleton watches go, this is absolutely up there. Really, really well done. Huge amounts of space and therefore, as you hold up to the light, huge amounts of kind of obvious space as you would expect from a properly skeletonized work, not just a couple of little spaces here and there to make you think that lots of time has been spent on it. It's got the Calibre 7124 in here, which was developed in conjunction with the 7121, which is in the more regular closed dial variants of the watch. Very thin as well. They've removed the date mechanism from this one, therefore that helps them to get the thickness of this movement down. 57 hours of power reserve, still not huge, but significantly better than the movements they were using prior to this. I think when we mentioned back in 22 these watches as they were released, we did comment that the old model maybe didn't have the greatest power reserve for its price point. Running at 4 hertz, which is the higher frequency than the old model as well. So yeah, lots of cool things going on with this watch if you're able to get your hands on it. They are limited production. They're not limited edition. They won't say how many they will or will not make, but I'm going to guess not a whole lot. If you want one, you'll probably have your work cut out to get to it. But if you've got the money and you fancy this, maybe this could be the watch of the skeleton to have on your wrist. When me and Dave were at dinner on Saturday night, we were talking about skeleton watches of the stainless steel variety, and there are a number out there. You've got stuff in the past from AP, you have got Oris with the Pro Pilot X that came out four or five years ago nearly. You've got Marilise Lacroix where you can see through stuff, they've got their own in-house movements and they've also got skeletonized other things. Norcane, another great manufacturer where you can see exactly what's going on, even through to Sega design that we've talked about at length on the show. This is a little bit more punchy price-wise, it has got the, the brand history, one of the Holy Trinity, but over 120 grand is a lot of chump change. So perhaps we should be focusing our attention slightly lower down on the price point and having a look at other things, perhaps in the next month or so. Who can say? And it's time to roll out the red carpet, not for Watchmakers Day, but the Oscars hit the headlines for pretty much all the good reasons, I suppose you could say, this year. Barbie didn't do too well, Oppenheimer did well, even though it was long, drawn out and quite boring, as we discussed. But something that always appears in watch media straight afterwards is the who, where, what, why and when. And on the red carpet, there were many timepieces to be spotted. And Dave, you have got the rundown, so let's quickly rattle through them. Quickly, off the top of my head, it appeared that a couple of brands definitely had a little bit more wrist presence than others. Omega definitely being one where there were many people wearing their watches. IWC featured up there as well, as did a couple of other brands such as Tag Heuer. And I'm going to jump in because I forgot to mention just before entering this segment, I have figured something out. I got to the bottom of a big dilemma. What's your dilemma? When I was in London at British Watchmakers Day, the amount of people I was speaking to that would finish a sentence with as well was incredible. And Dave stays in London most of the time when he's not in Scotland. So I think we finally figured it out. Dave is speaking English. As well, there were also lots of watches from other people, such as Jacob and Co. But giving it a bit of a rundown, one of the headliners, in fact, I think he won Best Actor, that being Killian Murphy, he was wearing a Omega, that being a 40mm steel Devil Prestige. Roger Federer, not a film star, but a tennis star, he was there wearing a Rolex, a brand which had a fair amount of presence at the show, albeit maybe not as much as some of the others. He was wearing the Daytona. They stealthily launched a rose gold day date with a funky dial by accident on purpose at there. But you can check the show notes for pictures of that one. Carry on, Dave as well. Robert Downey Jr., a man again who won, I believe, his first Oscar after having been nominated quite a few times in the past. He was wearing a JLC Reverso Tribute Chronograph in pink gold, and a rather nice watch that is as well. We also had Ryan Gosling. Of course, he could only be wearing a Tag Heuer, and he was wearing the Plasma Diamante 
the avant-garde. He wasn't wearing the pink Barbie watch as was maybe to be expected. We also had a showing from IWC with quite a few Portugueseers making an appearance. I guess it's a classy event and it's their classier watch. Maybe not the place for a pilot's watch. Matthew McConaughey, he did surprise me somewhat wearing a Jacob & Co. Jean Bugatti. It is a big and pretty uh, expensive watch. I think that would be the best way to describe it. Not maybe the watch I would have expected him to wear. Not that I would know which watch he would actually wear. Bradley Cooper was also there. He was wearing a Louis Vuitton tambour and Chris Hemsworth wearing an Audemars Piquet X Alex Royal Oak chronograph. The ugliest chronograph from Audemars Piquet in the history of chronographs from Audemars Piquet. But hey, it doesn't take it all. He's maybe got the looks, but he hasn't got the wrist. And that takes us to the end of this episode of the show. We're a little bit knackered, in case you can't tell. Both me and Dave made a few follies, a few mistakes in this episode that Ms. L will make sure it will never appears in the show notes and I'll make sure it never appears in the edit. But that is the end of a show. It's been a whirlwind week. We thought it'd be good. It was even better than we thought. And we can't wait for the next one. And we're going to do it all again shortly at Watches and Wonders. We are already seeing our inboxes being flooded with people wanting to see us, meetings, our agendas have been filled. We're actually getting the invites for all the things that happen at night where we find out all the juicy gossip, where we find out exactly what's happening with this brand, that brand, where things are going in the industry and what to look out for over the coming months. So yeah, be sure to be subscribed on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram at Scottish Watches. Check out our website, scottishwatches.co.uk. We're actually looking for people to help out because as Watches and Wonders approaches last year and the year before, Ms. L. Flawligas have had loads of help from people, but this year is going to be even bigger. So if you'd like to lend a hand, if you want to write an article, a preview piece, a review, help out with the Instagram or anything like that, you can join our community team. So drop us an email info at scottishwatches.co.uk don't dm us on instagram we don't get to see them or we very rarely get to see them so don't take offense if we don't get back to you there and that is it all we can really do is tell you to go through our back catalogue we've had some great episodes in the recent past rick remaker was on talking about collecting of all types independence plus holy trinity uh, from a very early age all the way through to later on in his life we had william messina from messina labs on talking about collabs and being pretty brutal with his mm, exposés of certain things within the industry. Andrew Morgan previously of Watchfinder, the Talking Hands guy, he was on explaining all his breakaway from that company to do his own thing and there are tons. Pietro from Limited Edition has got some articles appearing on the website as I speak so you'll want to read those, some independent some great creators that you may never have heard of and that is pretty much it. So thank you for watching thank you for listening and we'll catch you guys again soon. <laughs>